F-14 Tomcat, piloted by Lieutenant Devin Jones, was shot down on January 21st over the barren desert of Iraq. Once you've got a guy on the ground, you know he's there and you know he's alive, uh, it's time to change the plans and do whatever it takes to make sure you can get at him. Captain Trask and his crew flew many hours in broad daylight in their search for the stranded Navy pilot. And the hard part was, he was now so far north that we were going to have to cross the major uh, highways that run east-west from Baghdad over toward Jordan. Uh, and these were our biggest threats in the whole theater, was to cross those roads, because they were heavily traveled with military vehicles in the middle of the daytime. We were painted brown camouflage and just hoped we were far enough away they really wouldn't realize that we were bad guys. Uh, an Iraqi truck came in from our 11 o'clock position, and I called him out about the same time the A-10 pilot called him out on the radio and Major Homan, the co-pilot, told him to smoke the truck. We immediately made a break away from the truck, and the uh, A-10s immediately rolled in on it. And all we did was make one big loop and turn back toward it. And by the time we got turned back to the truck, it was just a big smoking hole. A uh, 30 millimeter can on an A-10 is gonna take out a truck every time. And, but the truck actually rolled up to within 50 or 100 yards of where uh, Lieutenant Jones had dug his hole in the desert, and it was coming straight at him. We made a real quick stop landing, rolled up right uh, next to him, uh, Pararescue me, jumped out of the back, ran him, grabbed him by the flight suit, pulled him on board. We were on, on the ground about 20 seconds, and we pulled pitch and turned back south uh, to get out of there. It was a great, great, great feeling. I mean, we still had to get out of Iraq, and that was just secondary, knowing that we had picked him up, and he was safe inside, and we were going to get him out of there. He came up to the cockpit and uh, stuck his head in there, a big grin on his face, and patted everybody on the shoulder. That was a pretty good feeling. I was glad to be a part of it. We, were all, we all were proud. I mean, we got one of our guys back. Soft Stories Live features guests who are often decades removed from an operation, so the stories are told as they remember them and are not cleared for release by the Department of Defense. All content discussed is unclassified and or publicly released by the DOD prior to this broadcast. Our intent is to share these moments in history as experienced by the special operators who were there. Good afternoon. I'm Chief Master Sergeant Randy Anderson, U.S. Air Force retired and former Air Commando and the host for today's Operation Desert Storm, the rescue of Slave Force 6. Thank you for joining us. Each month over the next several months, Soft Stories Live will invite former special operators represented from every service branch of U.S. SOCOM and explore past campaigns and operations, focusing solely on the historical context of special operations involvement from a personalized perspective. All guests are former special operators who served at the operationally deployed level. We will selectively choose officers and enlisted members for a particular topic based on their actual personal involvement in various operations, not from the campaign point of view, but as special operators at the tactical level. This venue will give them a unique opportunity to share with you, the audience, their insights and unbiased experiences from their personal point of view. Some of it widely documented in publications and film, and some of it not. This month marks the 30th anniversary of the events surrounding the U.S. buildup in the Persian Gulf, Operation Desert Shield, and the liberation of Kuwait, codename Operation Desert Storm. Today, Soft Stories Live is honored to welcome three Air Force Special Operators who executed this extremely high-risk mission and a successful rescue and recovery of the U.S. Navy F-14 Tomcat crew, call sign Slave Force 6. These special operators were in the dangerous forefront of this pivotal moment in special operations history and helped force successful U.S. and international policy to oust occupy, occupying Iraqi forces in the liberation of Kuwait. Today, I'm honored to welcome U.S. Air Force retired Air Commandos, my former squadron commander, Lieutenant General Tom Trask, Master Sergeant Craig Dock, and Master Sergeant Greg Van Heine. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome to Self, Soft Stories Live, and thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Before we get started, I'd like to give the audience a little back history on the rescue of Slate Force 6. Slate Force 6 is one of the most famous uh, missions uh, we flew during the Operation Desert Storm. It was a combat search and rescue sortie performed by A-10 Sandys and MH-53Js from the 20th Special Operations Squadron. This event occurred on January 21st, 19. 91 to recover Lieutenant Devin Jones, an F-14B pilot from the VF-103 Sluggers, call sign, call sign Slate 46. That was downed in Iraq with its 3-0 radar intercept officer, Lieutenant Lawrence Slate. 
The crew launched on their first combat mission to escort an EA-6B, supporting an early morning strike package hitting the Al-Assad airfield just west of Baghdad. During the egress from a target, Jones and Slave were shot down by an SA-2 Soviet-made missile, surface-to-air missile. That occurred at 0320 Zulu on the morning of the fourth day of the war, while returning the aircraft carrier USS Saratoga. After ejecting and during the, the descent, the two men saw each other for the last time before entering the clouds. And this is where the story begins. Gentlemen, let's start first with General Trask. General Trask, what was your rank, position, and assignment when you first learned you were going to deploy uh, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm? Chief, good afternoon. Good to talk with you. It's great to see you. Yeah, I was uh, I was a captain in the 20th SOS at the time, an MH-53 pilot. I was a plans officer in the squadron, and I got deployed over there, not with the very first wave, but about uh, three or four weeks later. So it was around uh, early September. Okay, what about you, Craig? Hey, Chief, thanks for having us on. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, I was uh, assigned to the 20th SOS. I'd been there about two years. I was a, uh, a Sergeant uh, E-4. I guess we used to call that a buck sergeant back in the day. Uh, aerial gunner. And, um, you know, beyond that, worked as a supply NCO in the 20th. Okay, and Greg Van Heining, uh same thing. Uh, what was your rank position assignment when you first were deployed there? How'd you wind up on this group? Well, I don't know uh, exactly how. Uh, let me first say thanks, Chief, for uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Chelsea. And uh, it's it's nice to be able to uh, take a moment and share this story with y'all. Um, at the uh, at the time, I was. Uh, instructor flight engineer, also uh, evaluator flight engineer. And I was working in the uh, Stan Aval office at that time. Um, the, uh, the assignment Sarah Hurlbert, you know, uh, they, as an instructor and evaluator, I'm constantly trying to put out the best product. And and I think not only from our crew, but from any crew that goes out to do a mission, those guys are ready to do it because we took our, our position seriously. And uh, now it, it's, it's just an honor to be here today. Thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. Uh, it, it's an honor to have you guys. General Trask, could you please give a brief explanation of why the MH-53's soft force with, from the newly established Air Force Special Operations Command, they had basically... Uh, migrated over from 23rd Air Force. Uh, we, we had a sister CSAR element at that time, but now the Air Force Special Operations Command, uh, the MH-53s were assigned to them under US SOCOM. What, uh, you were assigned to CPAR, CSAR mission as opposed to CSAR forces. Uh, what was the command relationship and why did the MH-53 Pavlo, a soft, uh, soft aircraft, wind up doing this mission? Yeah, it's an interesting story, Randy. They, you know, it, through the 80s, uh, the Air Force had always had its combat rescue forces in, in the mobility command, which was not the command that would have used those forces in combat. The, at the time, Strategic Air Command and Tactical Air Command had bombers and fighters that would use them. And there was a big argument in the Air Force of who should pay for CSAR forces. And what happened was nobody paid for them. And uh, like probably a lot of the guys in the 20th had done time in rescue units like I had. Uh, before I came to special operations, and those units closed down. My, I, my unit was at Edwards Air Force Base. It actually closed in 1987. So by the time the Gulf War happened, there were there were very little CSAR units left in the Air Force, and they, we hadn't started to build up the uh, MH60 uh, CSAR capability that would happen a few years afterwards. So when we got tasked to deploy under SOCSENT, under the special operations component, um, the uh, the joint force looked around for a force capable to do CSAR and realized there was no Air Force CSAR coming. And so that mission got handed off to the special operations component and not just for the MH-53s, but also the AFSOC H-60s and the uh, third of the 160th uh, uh, Army Special Operations Aviation was also part of that CSAR element. And that was one of our major missions going into the fight. Okay, and, and, and I, I think that's interesting to bring that up because uh, 
you know, they had expressed the capabilities document just prior to that and basically killed CSAR as we knew it uh, as a conventional air force and, and, and basically just said, we're personal recovery. There, there is significant difference in a combat search and rescue because there's certain sequence of events that have to occur. Uh, so I, I, I find that very interesting. Um, could you please help the audience understand what the location, the AOR situation, what you were doing the morning you were notified a US Navy crew was shot down and you were tasked for a rescue mission. Had you rehearsed or uh, you know, had you trained in CSAR rescue tactics in the desert prior to that? I'll, I'll start with you, Tom. Yeah, so we were, uh, we were on alert that morning for CSAR, for that purpose, uh, out in a, a base very northwestern part of Saudi Arabia called RR. Uh, later on, the JSOC folks would arrive there and would operate out of that base, but that was our base. And what we had done is divide Iraq into four areas for CSAR. Uh, the very western or southwestern part of the country was the part we were responsible for. There were two other bases in Saudi covering a central and eastern part, which included Kuwait. And then the, uh, the Sakir guys up in Turkey were covering the northern part for CSAR. So we had planned for it. It was not the mission we went and deployed to do, but during the Desert Shield portion over the previous two or three months, we'd spent most of our time uh, training and preparing for that mission. So we were actually on alert that morning. Uh, our crew, if you guys remember, was actually number six in line that morning because uh, in the first few days of the war, the 20th, our squadron was the one getting all the missions. We had led the Apaches on the first night. There had been a rescue attempt a couple nights earlier where they didn't didn't get the guy. It was He was captured. So the 20th was the only squadron that had gotten some time uh, across the border. So the uh, Colonel Garlington was the site commander that night. He put uh, our two Pavlos uh, at the back of the line behind two MH60s from the 55th and then two Navy H60s, which were also there doing CSAR. So we were kind of at the back of the priority line thinking we'd probably just get a good night's sleep that night. <laughs> yeah, uh, Greg, uh, uh, this is for Van Heining. Uh, what was your take on that? Well, you know, um... We, we go up there and you had just a big open area with a bunch of cots set up. And, uh, you know, you never knew what the weather was going to be. You know, I woke up one morning and, uh, well, actually one early, early. And uh, my, my feet were froze because I hadn't taken my boots off. <laughs> I went to warm up. I stepped outside and it was snowing, you know. So you never knew what you were going to have the weather up there, how cold it would be, how many people there would be there. But be assured, pretty much it, that the area where we were bunked at would be uh, would be full of operators in there, you know, both Army and Air Force, and you know that's that's all you did was was rest and you know try to have yourself ready to jump up and go when you got the call. Oh, okay, uh, Craig, what about your insights in, in that? You know, how did you prepare yourself? Uh, you know, during that time and understanding what your role was. Were you a little disappointed? What were your emotions during that time, Craig? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, first of all, um, I was uh, pretty gung-ho and, and, and ready to get out there and just get into the fight. So I wasn't disappointed at all to be sitting a CSAR alert. We kind of knew we were going to get that mission uh, initially. And we spent a significant amount of time actually training up. Um, you know, our pararescue men were attached to us, uh, made part of the hard crew. Uh, we got a chance to kind of gel and come together, uh, work on, you know, tactics, crew coordination, things like that. Several weeks prior to uh, the, the war kicking off and assuming those alert uh, missions, um, you know, we, we integrated with A-10s previously, did some daytime ops, uh, got to see them in their traditional Sandy role as a rescort, see the daisy chain. Uh, we worked on, um, you know, a lot of... Uh, of those, uh, you know, tactics that affect a, a successful pickup of a survivor. So authentication methods, you know, spinning chem lights on, on 550 cord, uh, you know, different signaling uh, devices and things like that. Uh, worked with our Siri instructors to kind of refine some of those techniques. So um, we were pretty well prepared, uh, well geared up. And, and uh, you know, I was just looking forward to uh, getting out there and uh, making something happen. So uh, I was pleasantly surprised that morning uh, when they woke us up, uh, told us, uh, 
that there was a shoot down, we're probably uh, going to get to uh, react to that. And I had asked one of the H-60 pilots across the table uh, what the weather was like. Had anyone checked weather? And he said, yeah, it's, it's zero, zero. And I just smiled at him and said, hey, pave country. You know, we, we, we have the tools to uh, make that work. So I was pretty excited to get going. Right. You know, I, and, 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 and that dovetails into the conversation. You know, this was a daylight rescue, uh, something that it, it, it is not in our wheelhouse. We don't like daylight rescues because we learned from Southeast Asia, we're extremely vulnerable in daytime rescues, uh, particularly in a hostile environment. Uh, unlike the other environments, we were no different thing. We were opposing a major uh, military force for the first time since Southeast Asia. Panama, you really couldn't count. Uh, the, uh, th this was uh, a, a sophisticated air defense system. So now we're doing this daytime as opposed to a nighttime. What type of preparation uh, did you do to solve for this? For example, how did you do to C2? What was the rescue package configuration, the crews? You know, how, how did you prepare? I, I, how did you work that? Greg, I'll start with you. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of uh, it, it starts at the ground level right there with your pre-flight. You go out there and you make sure that that aircraft is configured with every piece of equipment that you could possibly, eat, you know, require for, for any mission that you're called on. And then, then it's just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, bringing up your, your training. Uh, and, and that was the whole focus, you know, within the unit was you train exactly the way you're going to go fight. And there was, there was never an issue with this or that. We were easily brought back on the track by any obstacles we might've run to, you know, it's, it's, it's all about completing the mission and coming up with, with a, uh, with a viable answer to any roadblocks that you hit and moving on with it. And, and that's essentially, uh, the big thing there, it, it boils down a lot to, to add and that's mission accomplishment. No, oh, okay. Well, I, I, and I appreciate it. Tom, I, I, I'd like to go to you on this. Why did we use 50 cows? Why not mini guns? Why, why did we not do personal? What was the issue? Why, why the configuration we had? How did we go about, uh, authenticating survivors? You know, some of you had, uh, had prior rescue experience, but in the most part, you know, rescued the traditional classic as we knew it. We didn't really practice that, uh, but 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 there was a lot of carryover experience. Uh, would you like to discuss that with me, Tom? You bet. Yeah, I, I can talk about that. We talked a lot about configuration and and uh, uh, took a lot of advice from uh, uh, the guys that had a lot of experience. And we had, you know, we saw had Vietnam guys that had that were in the leadership positions there and some of the senior positions. We talked a lot about uh, how the business was done in Vietnam. You know, in Vietnam, they didn't use 50 cals on their 53s because the environment was completely different. A minigun was much more appropriate in Vietnam where you're going to have short range, you're in a tree line, you've got that to deal with. But we knew we were going to be operating particularly in daytime where you could see for 30 miles and everybody could see you for 30 miles and you needed a defensive weapon that could reach out you know, with the range of 50 cal. Uh, you know, to allow you to kind of break away from any kind of threat situation. Typically, our weapons with 350 cals mounted on the 53 are mostly designed to help you break contact uh, in a situation so you can get away. So the, the 50 cal was the obvious choice. We didn't normally fly 350s back at home, but that was what made sense in the desert there. And it was really the first time going into the Gulf War that we thought about it from that perspective. A lot of the other things that we had were, were just carryovers from Vietnam, like authentication procedures. It was the stuff that the guys had been taught in SEER school uh, for years. Now, there was some new things that were happening. If uh, you get into the details, the PRC-112 was the brand new survival radio that you could actually home on, but there were very few of them in theater. In our mission, it turned out that the front seater had the 112, or had the uh, old radio, the PRC-90. The back seater had the 112, which didn't work, which was a brand new radio. And we were just getting used to it. So we thought we'd be able to home in on his PRC-112, but that radio never came up. And we went back to old Vietnam style, homing in on the PRC-90 that the 
uh, the front seater carry that allowed us to, to pick him up. So uh, from that perspective, it was really a lot of the experience and lessons learned from Vietnam. Well, I and, and, and I can totally appreciate that, uh, General Trask. You know, Craig, uh, you know, let's talk about the navigation. Obviously, you can't do the classic non-combat search and rescue. You can't go out and do creeping lines, uh, you know, high look, bird, you know, attracting a lot of attention because they could see you from 20 miles away. Uh, it's pretty flat <laughs> where you guys were operating. How do you, how did you overcome that? Did you fly at a certain altitude? Uh, did uh, you know? Tell me, tell tell me what your tactics were for Craig. Okay, yeah, for Craig. So, uh, you know, uh, back then I was a tail gunner, so I was kind of uh, you know just trying to take a lot of that in as uh, the mission unfolded. Now, uh, keep in mind, uh, just as the general said. We had a lot of uh, Vietnam era TTPs uh, to employ in that situation. But as it turned out, you know, uh, zero visibility on the ramp at the time we were gonna spin the aircraft up and launch uh, presented a, a, a different challenge. Um, if uh, the guys remember, um, we had a compressor stall on run up and when that engine popped, Greg was running that engine up and it popped, you heard a loud bang. And he assumed one of us cut loose 50 cal round uh, in the back uh, on the ramp as we were arming up, just kind of getting things ready to go uh, during, during the spin up. So, um, you know, stranger things would unfold, but, um, you know, we, we got the aircraft run up and initially to take off in zero visibility and, and you know, immediately transition into a trained following a profile, you know, I felt pretty comfortable with that initially because I'm like, well, yeah, I can't see anybody, but they can't see us. So I felt pretty good about being uh, cloaked uh, in that weather until we uh, broke out uh, pretty much right at the border. Um, so then things got interesting, you know, we, we kind of dropped down to a, a lower altitude. Um, Typically, uh, day tac, uh, just to get some visibility and things, we might be around 100 feet or 80 feet, but uh, we weren't far uh, north of the border when uh, the radio chatter spooled up and we were told that uh, a MiG was inbound, uh, had us locked up and uh, we're probably gonna get shot at. So at that point, it got pretty exciting. Um, a quick discussion that I recall up front uh, between um, Tom and Mike uh, were, well, you know, if we snap south towards the border, how close to the border are we going to get before he catches up to us? You know, at whatever he was doing, 500 knots or something, it's like, well, not very far. So the decision was just made to get lower at that point and keep trucking. So we were down around, I don't know, 15, 20 feet uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, we got pretty comfortable at being that low. Um, and uh, that's just one of the things that happens in real time when you just got to make an adjustment and, and make it work. But funny, you should say that we, we should not have been out there uh, doing traditional, you know, SAR uh, patterns like a creeping line or expanding square. But as I recall, um, you know, initially we didn't have a good fix on the survivor. Um, overhead uh, capabilities, air breathers, we could hear AWACS, uh, maybe some other fighters were, were further up in the cap. Um, trying to make contact, but we were given vectors a couple of times to, to hit a different coordinate and literally search that area. So, so we did start kind of sweeping across the desert and poking around and, uh, and uh, you know, every now and then we, we'd see something interesting. I think we saw an ejection seat or something out there. We made a landing, poked around at it. Uh, so um, things just kind of evolved. You know, we had to roll with it. You know, every 10, 15 minutes, it was a different thing happening that we made decisions and we adjusted our, our tactics accordingly. Hey, Randy, if I can jump in and just add to that, because you talk about the daytime element. This was the first day that we'd even sat alert in daytime. For the first days of the war, we weren't even allowed to sit alert and there was no consideration of going in daytime because of the, the IADs were heavy enough that we, everything had been planned to go only at night. We had briefed all of the tactical crews that if they got shot down, they would have to make it till darkness and then the special ops crews would come and get them. And so this was the first time when the IADs had been degraded just enough that they would at least consider sending us in the in daytime. And so it was the first first mission flown in daytime by any of us going in, in as part of the Gulf War. 
Well, I, I, and, and thank you for that, uh, General Trask. I appreciate that. Now, your crew configuration, obviously, you got two pilots, two engineers, uh, and, and, and two gunners on, uh, for the audience uh, on an MH-53 payflow. Uh, but they, you also have a rescue element on there. Uh, and in more modern times, we use SF, uh, Special Forces, Green Beret, uh, ODA types, or we use SEALs. Uh, but in this case, we went with the traditional uh, uh, more CSAR platform uh, rescue package. Uh, explain who, who was the rescue uh, uh, element on, on the aircraft with you, the people that would actually disembark the aircraft and, and go. And I'll start with you, Tom. Yeah, so, you know, as those Air Force CSAR units had shut down, the pararescue community had not condensed. So there were lots of PJs out there that didn't have uh, helicopter units to be a, attached to anymore. So we, we actually had a fair number of PJs that were deployed there. So the, the tactic we came up with, which uh, was to add two PJs as the standard configuration. So we had two added to our aircraft, our wingman, uh, Mike Kingsley's aircraft had two. So uh, the two guys, Tom Bedard and Ben Pennington were the two guys, I believe they, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they had come out of Kadena. Uh, they were not part of our squadron. They were just part of the PJ task force that was formed to help us do the CSAR piece. And they weren't integrated into the air crew like they had been in the rescue days, uh, you know, prior to the Gulf War. So they were largely passengers on the airplane during the tactical uh, employment of our mission and then were there to, to do the uh, actions on the objective to pull the guy in and then to treat him uh, with the medical pieces if that was needed on the way back. You know, uh, in, in, in the broadcast, I appreciate that, General Trask. You know, uh, Greg, uh, who, who was the PJ in that, uh, in that uh, opening film clip? I, I think Chelsea has a picture of that also, uh, that, that she could, uh, you know, who is uh, rescuing the pilot? Who, who, who was that pararescue man? Yeah, we, we had two uh, pararescue men on board, uh, uh, Tom Bedard and uh, Ben Pennington. And uh, Ben Pennington uh, was the PJ who, who added out the ramp to uh, meet the pilot and bring him back on. Oh, okay. And uh, no, um, both, yeah. both PJs were, were, were great guys and uh, uh, absolutely uh, dedicated as all those younger PJs are. And uh, it, it, it's always nice to have them alone because you never know what's gonna happen. And you're talking about world-class uh, paramedic uh, skills right there at hand, you know, to help you out. If, if you've got somebody that gets wounded on board the aircraft, a crew member or anybody else. Awesome. Uh, now. Guys, uh, now that we did this, and, and, and Craig, I'm going to address it to you first. So what impressed you or inspired you during the mission? What made you laugh? And how did the crew communicate their concerns during the rescue? Because it wasn't, I, 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 I want to illustrate this for the audience. It wasn't a quick jump across the border, make the rescue, and then come back, and the whole thing's done in 20, 30 minutes. Uh, it turned out to drag out quite a while. We, we, let's start with you, Craig. Yeah, um, you know, it was uh, pretty dynamic, you know, on, on the way in again, I, I said earlier, we did not have uh, an initial fix on the survivor. Um, we didn't know exactly where he was. So uh, as we as we drove in uh, initially, uh, you know, um, the A-10s that would have been uh, uh, covering us uh, in that rescort role had weather delayed back at the base where uh, they were launching from. So. Uh, my perception was that we were actually in there alone, single ship uh, to begin with, until uh, the MIG cap uh, got busy. Uh, they scrambled some F-15s in our area to chase the MIG out, and one F-15 actually dropped down to about, you know, I don't know, about 2,000 feet or so and circled around us, you know, waggled the wings there and uh, got a visual on him. And that was the first time I felt like there was actually somebody in the airspace with us that could actually help us out. Uh, beyond that, it was command and control, you know, chatter from the AWACS. Uh, you could hear them talking to fighters or tankers or other assets. And so, um, you know, uh, we 
we did a lot of searching around, like I, I uh, mentioned before. And at some point, uh, we simply uh, hit bingo and we had to return back to our uh, staging base to refuel. So on our egress uh, from the, the area, um, working our way back towards the border, um, luckily um, people were ready to get in there uh, if the situation would allow. We had a tanker hanging out right on the border, was running up and down just in case uh, there, there was a potential to, to send them in. Uh, but we were able to get out uh, with our uh, min fuel and make it back to the base and hit the hot refueling pits. Uh, and that's when things began to change. So, so we spent uh, a full uh, mission, you know, bag of gas, as we like to call it, uh, in, in the area. And we're back out refueling. And that's when uh, the radio chatter picks up where the A-10s had then gone over us and deep down into the uh, battle space uh, uh, made radio contact with Devin Jones at that point and began to authenticate him. And when I heard uh, chatter from the AWACS talking about the authentication process over the radio, um, you know, I got pretty excited. We we're refueling. We had a few minutes left in the hot pits. Uh, we had another aircraft that just arrived uh, and uh, cocking their bird for alert. So, um, you know, things were about to change. Uh, we're about to get the opportunity to go back in this time as a two ship formation with some mutual coverage. Uh, it's always good to have your buddies with you. And um, and the A-10s were now uh, in, in the airspace uh, where they're going to be able to provide some support as well. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's interesting you said that. Uh, Greg, would you like to say, you know, what, how did the crew communicate? Uh, was there a lot of apprehension? Uh, you know, were there concerns? that uh, I know I know uh, Tom was sitting up in the front seat and has to filter all that information but but at, at, as the center seat flight engineer you're sitting up there do you that kind of vet that th those questions as, as your job as a flight engineer uh, would you explain uh, uh, for for the audience you know how how were concerns communicated things weren't going as, as, that well uh, so it wasn't just a cut and dry, cross the border, pick the guy, run out. A lot of people have that perception. Would you like to provide us with the insight on that? Well, uh, you know, while we were in the hot pits there, like uh, like Craig had mentioned, you know, uh, radio chatter picked up. Uh, the A-10s had, had a uh, position on the survivor. And this was, this, this really got me pumped, you know, because now we know where he's at. Previously, you know, we had uh, spent all of our time chasing goose eggs out there, you know, and not really coming up with anything. Now we've got something we can go for. And when you've got something you can go for, man, you you get pumped and you're ready to go do it. And so then, so then it, it's just a matter of getting coordinates down, getting your system set up, and and having a general idea and, and talking with your wingman, you know, what we're going to do and, and how we're going to proceed up there. And uh, actually, you know, when, when you talk about this is, this is where we all step up, you know, and it's all because of our training, you know, that is, we'll take it and run. Don't tell us, don't tell us how to do it. Just tell us what you want the end result to be. We'll figure it out and en route. Well said. Uh... Uh, Tom, I'm going to push it back to you. Uh, were you forced to improvise, adapt, or innovate during that mission? And so what, what exactly did you do different that you did not expect to do? I'll start with Tom. Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. But the first one I want to say is kind of back on that last topic and what Greg was saying is it, it, it really comes down to you will end up operating the way you trained. And if you simulate things in training, you won't remember to not simulate them when you get to combat and, right. and that the nerves raise, everybody's uh, anxiety raises and, and you start trying to think faster than you really ought to. It goes back to what Craig said about the, when we started engines that morning and we compressor stalled number two engine on the engine start. Only time it ever happened 20 years of flying 53 is that I in, <laughs> compressor stalled on a startup. Right. So I immediately start processing all of these bump plans and all things are going. I think it was Greg who said, I think we just start number one today first. And we shut down number two, started number one. 
Everybody looked at each other, started number two again, and it cranked right up and flew for eight hours that day and flew all day long. And it, it was that kind of thing that kind of brings everybody back down and just go at the normal speeds, do it the way you've been trained. But to answer your question specifically, I, you know, we did a few things like when we finally got there, we finally, we'd gone four hours up in Iraq without any radio communications um, with Lieutenant Jones. And finally the A-10 guys get him on the radio. We now know he's alive. At that point, we had f- we figured based on the previous few days, he had already gotten rolled up and was probably already captured. The re- that was had to be the reason why we couldn't get him on the radios anymore. And then they reestablished radio contact. We started pushing up there, but we got to figure out some way to communicate with an A-10 when we have no uh, secure comms, we're all operating and we don't have anybody vectoring us. The AWACS are so far away. We're 600 miles away from the nearest allied forces at that point. Wow. And I got to figure out a way to get the, the coordinate uh, that he's got on his old inertial navigation system that hasn't been updated in about six hours we know it's somewhere in the ballpark. He's operating so far north that he's off the charts that he had. He actually didn't have a map of the area that he was working on when he moves up to find the survivor. And we basically had to take out of the ATO, we took the number of the day. I said, took the last four coordinates or the last four digits of each coordinate, the north and the easting and said, use the number of the day, add that number to it and pass that to me. And then we're sitting there and Greg and Jim and, and Mike and I are trying to uncode that number with a code system that we just made up. And we don't really have time to think about how easy it is if somebody's listening to us because we know the Iraqis are now listening to us on a basic rescue frequency that's, that is not secured that the whole world can listen to. Right. Uh, and so we made up a coding system so that he could pass us coordinates. That that's really interesting, and 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 I, that sort of dovetails into what I want to talk about. Okay, uh, you guys have been out there a while. Uh, the Rockies finally found you. Okay, and they 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 were on on to the on to you at at that point. Uh, the ground forces. There were helicopters, other helicopters out there. Things started getting a little exciting uh, just prior to the pickup. Craig, I'm I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Yeah, um, you know, so so we're two ship. Uh, we're, we're back in towards the general area where uh, the survivors are located, and um, you know, at least we had the A10s overhead at that time. So it was uh, pretty comforting uh, to have those guys kind of kind of leading us in, giving us a vector, and um, marking the location for us. I believe the call was uh, by the lead A10. Um, I'm going to overfly the survivor, and I'm going to go vertical and aim for that direction, right? He's gonna be right about there. So uh, Tim Hadrich uh, up on the left gun was uh, you know, scanning, uh, had kind of that activity on his side of the aircraft and, and could see that play out. Um, we had left our, our sister ship uh, you know, behind uh, about a mile or two. I can't remember exactly how far, but I, I believe the discussion was we're going to go in for the pickup. You guys hang here. And then if we ball it up, you can come get all of us. But, uh, you know, the, the challenge uh, in the desert was, was always ever the dust out landing. Um, you know, that's something we spent a lot of time uh, gaining some proficiency in. And um, usually, uh, you know, most crews got proficient at doing that, doing that at night. Uh, but it had to be a very well uh, set up approach, um, you know, hover symbology, all that good stuff to make sure that you could stick those dust out landings the first time. So um, when you're coming in kind of hot and a lot of uh, actions happening all at once, um, you kind of what's going through my mind is, you know, we're just going to go screaming in there. We're probably not going to have a chance to set up uh, that nice, long, comfortable approach uh, or at least a typical profile. Um, the radio chatter's going. Um, we got a vehicle ingressing the scene, uh, Iraqi truck, and we know, okay, they've DF'd them. They're coming right for them, and uh, some things have to happen here. So like we saw in the video, um, uh, Mike Homan, uh, co-pilot, tells the A-10, hey, smoke the truck. We go into a right-hand 360. Now, as, as we break into that turn, all of that activity becomes to uh, comes into my azimuth as the tail gunner, right? So I got a nice wide field of view. I'm looking around. 
uh, for the activity to come into my azimuth. I'm pointing my 50 cal. Uh, what I actually saw first was uh, the first A-10 nosedive hit the gun and actually missed the truck. So at that point, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get a chance to go hot here. But, you know, we're still maneuvering, right? We have to land and, and you know, this, this is rapidly unfolding. So uh, the, the second day 10 uh, tells the lead guy to roll out and then he hits his gun and he just nails that truck dead on and um, just smokes it. It's, it's fire and smoke and just stuff blasting way up into the air. And at that point, you know, I'm hearing the comms up front, you know, there he is, roll out. We have to flare uh, and, and uh, stop the aircraft before we, we fly past him. Um, at that point, you know, as the tail scanner, tail gunner, my responsibility is is the, literally the tail of that aircraft. My concern is that thing is going to hit the ground and get ripped off, and then we're all going to be sitting in the LZ sideways. So uh, as we flared and we come into the dust, luckily I still had the ground, and I had the ground, and I had the uh, tail skid and the tail rotor in front of me. And uh, at that point, I don't know if anyone remembers it, but I yelled, roll the nose over right as we were touching down because we were about to plow some ground with that tail skid. And I literally thought we were going to rip it off. But luckily, we got the aircraft stopped uh, in time that our survivor was still a beam at about the two o'clock position. We didn't fly past him and um, we were able to, uh, you know, complete the actions on the objective. Uh, I, I that. That's an amazing recount, Craig. I appreciate that. Uh, Greg, do you got anything to add to that? Well, um, you know, when, when that first A-10 miss, it's, it, it, myself, I was wanting to shrink. <laughs> and so rather than watch, I, I saw the wingman roll in and hit it, you know, and that was like a big relief for me because I thought things were really going to, get heated up you know when the first a10 mission and being in that center seat you know you're 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 just there for the show and uh no no way to react or, or nothing you can do except your positions duties right then and there and that you know was airspeed and altitude get it on the ground so we can get in here get this guy and get on out and uh yeah it when when you have that happen and that's the most vivid memory out of the uh out of the whole for me was was watching that first a10 missing and thinking uh oh <laughs> that is this this isn't good so uh but but the wing the wingman as soon as he broke off the, his wingman was on him and and like craig said he that that truck was just hopping along just just taking all those impacts from that 30 mil and, and uh it was awesome to see that and uh now, good, good to get on the ground and get that pilot, you know, and that, that's a matter of getting up and getting out of there and, and getting back. And, and that becomes another story. Right. Uh, you, you know, that that whole scenario turns into something that, that it, turn, it can quickly turn into a horror story. One of you get knocked down. Now you've got everyone scrambling to figure out how to rescue the rescue force. Uh, luckily, that that didn't occur. Uh Tom, I'm going to start with you. What emotions did you experience after the rescue when you you got him, you're flying him away? Uh, and what was your emotions? You knew you, you were missing one. You didn't have the whole crew. Uh, you still had Lieutenant Slade, the, the Rio, that was missing. You couldn't be recovered, and the mission was terminated. What what was your feelings over it? Did you want to keep going? This is for Tom first. Yeah, sure. I mean, we were, obviously, once we got, in the air and, and got headed south. You know, one of the things that had that Craig uh, had mentioned earlier, the, our wingman had actually stayed south a ways south of the major highway that was was back there. And when we finally got it, got him on board and turned south, the A-10 guys asked us, how'd you guys get across the highway? And we told him, well, we just kind of pretended like we belong there and just kind of climbed up a little bit and cruised across. And because he was surprised that that road was supposed to be kind of a barrier. We really weren't supposed to be operating that far north that day in the middle of daytime. Our wingman, Mike Kingsley and his guys were supposed to have waited because that was what we thought was the biggest threat. As soon as we picked up and headed south, here comes the other Pavlo almost nose to nose with us. Yeah. I asked him later, I said, 
you, you were supposed to wait south of the road. How come he goes, when we heard all that mess going on on the radio, there was no way we could wait. And so they immediately plugged across the road and showed up just about the time that we were taking off and heading south. But we still had probably an hour and a half, hour, 40 minutes just to get back to the border. So we had a lot of work to do. Uh, obviously, um, Devin Jones is in the back. The first thing he does is ask the guys in the back there and ask us what we knew about his Rio and whether or not he and anybody had heard from him and nobody had heard a radio call from him since about eight in the morning. And it was about two in the afternoon, something like this, by the time we had finally made the pickup. So we'd been on the mission about six hours. Nobody had heard from him. At the same time, we were thrilled that we finally got one guy on the radio. This, he, his reel was not the first guy that we had not been able to rescue. The, they were getting picked up really quickly. There were probably had been 16, 18 guys shot down by that point in the war, just in the fourth day. And we had, we had only had one other attempt and we hadn't been able to pick up anybody because there was nowhere to hide for them. And it took too long to get there. And by the time we ever could get forces arranged to go, they had already been picked up. So we were thrilled that it was at least an example that we would continue to try, even if it was hard for them to evade. And just that would be a great example for the rest of the combat air forces out there that we had picked him up. Well, one thing we didn't uh, we didn't clarify, you, you know, your call sign was a moccasin call sign. It was moccasin 05. Uh, you weren't the, the only 53 out there. And I, I wanted to clarify that for the audience that you weren't uh, alone and, and unafraid out there. There. Uh, there's a, a good graphic. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, that's, uh, that's the actual crew of uh, Moccasin 05. I, I, I believe you had Mike Kingsley's crew out there as well. Uh, and uh, his crew was standing by just anxious to get into the fight with you uh, just, just as much. And I, I know as a high bird, it, it's very difficult uh, for the pickup bird and, and, and to just sort of feel helpless, uh, but, but you, you have a role. Uh, Craig, could you help explain to the audience the, the, the whole, you know, we just don't go in as, as a single ship. Could you explain to the audience what the other role was for the high bird? Well, um, you know, I think typically um, the, the high bird um, can offer some degree of, uh, you know, mutual support in the sense of uh, fire support. Um, you know, you're, you're not as, uh, you know, uh, involved in, uh, you know, trying to break contact with, with any potential uh, targets on the ground or things like that. Actions on the objective, uh, what we call, you know, IP inbound, are really about uh, performing the maneuver in the terminal area, whether that's um, air to land or some form of alternate insertion extraction, you know, hoist work or a ladder or a fast rope. Um, and in that in, in that case, um, you're involved with the actions right over the objective. So the high bird, um, mutual support, security, um, you know, anybody else trying to uh, break into the area, um, they can defend, um, they can break contact with the ground, they can provide command and control or comm relay or anything of that nature. And of course, uh, you know, self-SAR uh, within uh, the, the same type of aircraft is, is always a, uh, um, likely uh, the need. You know, when you have a, a large aircraft uh, with a large crew, if that goes down, probably the only thing that's going to come rescue you is another like kind aircraft. So to have that attached uh, in the general area is always an added layer of security and comfort uh, and mutual support. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Uh, Greg, you know, after this was over, you rescued. Uh, you were back at RR, you, you, you recovered, you got him uh, whisked off. What changed for you personally uh, after this mission? Did, did, did it change you? Because this is probably the biggest mission of your life ever. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, as any uh, Pablo worth their medal, uh, they always want the mission and, uh, you know, that, that helps define them. Uh, how did this personally affect you? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying I had a, I had a year in air rescue, uh, a one-year break from the 20th there where I went over to Korea to the 38th, and I had uh, 58 or nine saves, you know, in one year over there. Um, and I had one, you know, that uh, was, was 
particularly noteworthy, and I won't go into that here, but I'll, I'll just say this was just another rung higher in the ladder for me. And, but, you know, it, it's, it's still what, what I train to do. So right. it, it, I'm, I'm paid to do that. And I, I don't know that I feel anything really any different or it changed me in any way, you know, uh, a lot of it's, you know, we, we did the air show route for a while, you know, when I got back, you know, I went to some air shows, told some stories and, and that's all nice. But, but the bottom line is, you know, that's, that's my job. That's what I was getting paid for. And there's some missions, you know, this, this one be in combat. Like I said, that's just another rung up the ladder higher than what I had done when I was in air rescue. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, um, I don't, I don't think it made any big choose in me, you know, it, it keeps you fired up though, you know, right. It, it, it you, you want to keep going and get that next big mission. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Craig, what about you? Yeah, I'd say uh, that, um, you know, I, I was at a decision point uh, in my career where I didn't really know if I was going to stay in. Um, you know, I was toying with the idea of getting out, going to school, doing some other things. Um, and then we had a few folks even um, transition over to the Army, uh, become warrant officers and maybe go fly and, uh, and take that track. So um, coming off that that rescue and kind of how things unfolded um, after that, it really uh, solidified my desire to stay in Pavlo and, and to do more with the opportunity uh, in Pavlo and make a career of it. So, um, you know, I got promoted shortly thereafter, which uh, would assure me some longevity uh, without hitting a higher tenure to be able to, uh, to retrain and do some other things. So, um, Within a year, I was offered the opportunity to cross train to be a flight engineer. Right. Um, so moving from uh, you know the back of the helicopter uh, all the way up to the cockpit, uh, getting up front and and being able to make things happen, to, you know, to be like Greg, uh, was a was a start, right? Um, as things would would subsequently uh, unfold, you know, I think I think you know people had confidence in in at least my ability. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to be a, a better leader, you know, integrated on a crew, you know, you get more responsibility, you get more opportunities to be, uh, you know, that, that lead NCO uh, on a crew and, and take them out, you know, for training evolutions or whatever may come. It's like, hey, you know, get Doc to take those guys out. So, you know, opportunities like that uh, would evolve and, and, and um, you know, and I guess that's all I want to say about that. No, I and, and and I totally can appreciate that. And you indeed uh, did cross train to a little bit more challenging position for the for the audience. Uh, uh, flight engineers are gunners too, uh, uh, but uh, that's why there's two. It's a little bit of combat redundancy. Uh, hey, one goes down, the other one moves up until there's no more left. Uh, that that was the whole concept. Uh, you can take that all the way back from the B seventeen days uh, when gunners and and engineers were all gunners. Uh, but anyway, uh, Tom, uh, what lessons did you learn? I mean, did this rescue uh, affect your your whole ability? Did it change uh, your life and, and how you trained other pilots or new special operators and, and how you led others? Did Was this a defining moment for you? And I'll, I'll extend this to General Trask. Yeah, I think at, at the beginning, in particular, like, like uh, Greg said, at that moment, we didn't understand that this mission would really be unique. We thought it was just breaking the seal, that it was going to be the first of, of many missions and, and more rescues. There were two other combat rescues that happened during the Gulf War. They were One was done by the Army, picking up an Air Force pilot. One was done by the Navy, picked one up in the, in the Persian Gulf. But that was a pretty small number. But what changed... Uh, really in a matter of days afterwards is that the Iraqi IADs continued to be degraded and come down and our missions all focused back to normal special operations missions. We spent most of the rest of, uh, of Desert Storm flying Pinsgowers and doing very heavyweight special operations work, uh, really thinking about new ways to, to function our weapon system in, at weights that we had never planned to do. And that became something that stuck 
with us in Pavlo for the, the red next 20 years of the life of the weapon system as we came back and we did a, a, a max gross weight increase of 8,000 pounds up to 50,000. And all that was based on what came after the rescue. I think it was after the war before we realized the impact that the rescue mission had. And then all of a sudden we found out we were being put in for these high level uh, medals for that mission. And really we'd gone on and done all these other things and not that we'd forgot about it, it was still a very cool thing that we'd done, but it kind of got a life of its own uh, later on after the war. And so uh, what I learned, what affected me is I became a spokesman and not just for the crew and for our squadron, but for special operations in general, because I, I ended up traveling with the SOCOM commander for a while, telling my little war story and representing Air Force Special Operations. I would go out to the Marine Corps Tactical School where they would study how to do what the Marines call TRAP, which is tactical recovery, air crew and personnel. And, and so we would compare notes on how we did rescue and the lessons that we had learned. Um, and so for me, it, it, it meant I had to think broader than just being a crew commander. Uh, which is all I was focused on at that point in my career, uh, that it was important to go out and, and think about how we integrated with the rest of the Joint Force and with the big Air Force. Well, you know, in, and you did. You were awarded the Silver Star, uh, and, and Craig and Greg were awarded Distinguished Flying Crosses. I'd say uh, this was significant impact admission, even though you did other things. And uh, uh, the Air Force thought so too. Uh, we weren't so popular with the Air Force back in the, uh, what I used to call the wonder years in the 80s uh, during the Tactical Airlift Command. We, we, we were an afterthought, uh, un underfunded, underpaid, and, and overlooked, I always used to say. But now, uh, all of a sudden, you guys are awarded for the best meritorious flight of the year by the Air Force. Uh, the award uh, was, was called the McKay Trophy for the audience. So Chelsea just put up the graphic. Uh, that it was it was an amazing and defining moment for you all. Uh, Craig, how did that impact you? That did, did, did it matter, or you just went on being Craig? <laughs> yeah, I think you know me already uh, better than that. Yeah, I just I, I kind of went on being Craig. You know, the um, I had a lot of. Uh, a lot of runway ahead of me and what I was going to end up doing uh, as a Pavlo guy. You know, I, I was pretty young back then. I'd only been in the squadron two years. And um, and I would, again, cross-train, become a flight engineer, and then move all the way through uh, to a 20-year uh, end in, in my career where my focus was to remain in the weapon system, um, to take advantage of, of all the things that changed after Desert Storm, the, the technology insertions, um, you know, the, the uh, capabilities that we later gained to geolocate survivors, um, to, uh, you know, I'd ask Matt and, and those kinds of modifications to the aircraft, um, you know, to, to change and, and improve our TTPs. You know, all of that just became my focus. You know, we, 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 we sought other venues to try to, you know, sharpen the spear, so to speak. We spent some time uh, with the Marines and WTI. Uh, we later got into the weapons school with the Air Force. And, and um, you know, I went hard over on a tactics uh, focus for really the rest of my career. Um, I did a lot of other things, you know, after that rescue um, in theater and beyond, you know, the, the Balkans uh, were a thing, Africa, different places. And, um, you know, it, if, if anything, it just um, kind of uh, set in a lot of other people's minds that if you want to end up doing some really cool stuff, you need to have Craig Dock on your crew. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Greg, uh, I'll, I'll finish that thought with you. Go ahead. Uh, well, you know, it. It's a, uh, it's just a great uh, honor, you know, to be submitted for something like that, you know. Um, I'm, I'm like Craig, you know. Uh, I started out as a gunner, you know, and I became a flight engineer because there were people who were mentoring me who believed my capabilities and and my ability, you know, to go ahead and and excel and move further up up the chain, and. While I didn't move to the top of the chain in terms of ranks, certainly I moved to the top of the chain in terms of abilities and, or capabilities. And um, it's, it's nice to have the recognition. And 
I'm, I've just been blessed, you know, uh, in a lot of ways throughout my, my Air Force career, you know, with, with opportunities and being at the right place at the right time and never giving up. You get the mission done and get the aircraft home. That's uh, well said. Uh, Chelsea, that, I, I, I know there's got to be some audience out there that, that really have some questions for, uh, for the panel. Go ahead and I'll turn it over to you. All right, yeah, we have quite a few questions and we're running low on time, so we'll try to do some quick fire answers here. Right. Um, the first one comes from our friend Dirk in Belgium. He said he wants to know which weapons and equipment were carried for survival and evasion purposes by the MH-53 crew. Was there any specific equipment for that? Uh, Craig, I'll turn that over to you if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, you know, we, we had... Um, pretty limited uh, quality of, of, of uh, self-protection and, and survival gear. We, we had the old school survival vest with a, a PRC-90 radio, uh, you know, a couple of signaling flares, um, you know, that sort of thing, maybe a strobe light. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, we had to adjust, or at least I did, being in the back of the helicopter was um, we didn't traditionally fly with body armor. So we had... Um, Vietnam era, what we called chicken plate, very heavy, bulky body armor. So I pretty much had to dismantle uh, the typical survival vest that I would fly with and figure out ways to take only the essential pieces of uh, air crew life support equipment that I felt I needed. Um, and then I would shed the rest that was superfluous and maybe gear up with more ammo. Uh, uh, Self-protection, um, obviously nine mil Beretta, um, some version of, of what was an M16 uh, platform, uh, but modified. Um, I had a shotgun, grenade launcher, those kinds of things. But, but really for the, uh, you know, for, for survival um, and for, to affect our own pickup, the, the key things are definitely a radio and extra batteries, a strobe light. And believe it or not, that, that chem light on a piece of 550 cord, when you spin that thing around, that became... Um, very recognizable at long distances, either on MVGs, uh, you know, whether it be IR or an overt chem light. Um, and so just having that kind of stuff on hand was about the best we could do at the time. You know, technology uh, would, would pour it in and give us better options, you know, 10 years down the road. But that's pretty much what we had then. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Greg, uh, what about you? Real quick. Okay, well, Greg didn't do that. Let's go ahead and uh, ask the other question. All right, so this comes from Johnny. He wants to know if you can expand on the lessons learned from this rescue changing thing. For example, did TTPs get changed? How did long-term policy or deployment priorities change? Anything like that? Yeah, I can, I can jump in with that. A lot of, you know, the rescue community was standing back up. We were building an MH64. So they studied the mission a lot. And they studied a lot of the successes and failures of CSAR in general in the Gulf War and because the record was very poor across the Gulf War. But there were some unique reasons operating in the desert. And the biggest one was you can't take all these Vietnam lessons learned that we're fighting in the jungle, apply them to a desert environment, and primarily in the evasion piece of it. And then in the electronically locating survivors, that was the hardest part was was uh, the distances were so vast, those radios did only had very short uh, uh, limits on them as far as how far they would work. And it was really hard to get communications uh, with survivors after they were shot down. A lot of time was spent to improve that capability going into the Balkans Allied Force and eventually into Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, Tom, I, I, I'd like to caveat that there, there were uh, terms that we'd never seen or used before. This is also for the audience where we develop what we call spider routes or, or different way. A, a, a lot of people say point A to point B, let's go rescue them. And, and no, no, we had uh, routes that we studied. Uh, we, we looked at threats and we planned accordingly. Uh, so a, a lot of the audience didn't, and, and, and that same uh, use of tactic and, and mission planning carried over into Allied Force. And I, I, I would like to, to add that. Uh, Chelsea, I think we have time for one more question, and we'll, that's, right. that's all we can. Uh, Rick wants to know if you guys have stayed in touch with or reconnected with the pilot that you rescued. Any of you? 
I think the only time I ever had contact with him was after, well, literally the next day after the rescue, he came over to our hooch where we were living before they flew him out to go out back out to the Red Sea. He was off a carrier in the Red Sea uh, is where he was based. But about six months after the war, we went up to damn that or up to Oceana to do deck landing calls. Were you guys on that? When, and he was still in the squadron up in Virginia Beach and his squadron hosted all of the 20th guys that were up there doing our DLQs for a week and uh, had a pretty good beer blast that uh, that week over at the squadron at Oceana. But that's the last time I saw him and that was 1991. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's when I saw him again as well as at Oceana. Uh, we traded some patches and coins and uh, had a good, uh, good chat, a good recap on how things went down. Um, oddly enough, about, uh, well, about five or six years later, I was in England and I ran into one of the A-10 pilots uh, that was overhead uh, during the uh, actions on the objective there. So it was kind of cool to catch up with just somebody else involved in the, in the whole event and kind of recap the story and talk it through. But yeah, um, would like to see Devin Jones again. Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, one thing I, I wanted to mention uh, earlier was that, um, you know, that Rio, Lieutenant Slade, uh, I, I had a fear back then that he might have been in the truck that got blown up on the scene and, uh, and that we, we probably weren't going to see him again for that reason. So I just want uh, people to know that the fact that uh, a few days later, we actually saw him on the news as, as one of the captured um, actually gave me a sigh of relief at that point. I knew there was a, a possibility that uh, we would recover him later, but I was definitely relieved um, that uh, he wasn't in that truck. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe he was uh, kept uh, 43 days in captivity. He was tortured and, and they had a lot of fun with him, uh, which, which was terribly unfortunate. Uh, we don't want that fate and, and that's why we had always uh, carried on the mantra that others may live from our rescue uh, experience and, and days that we, we, no one's left behind. And, and, and we'd put every asset uh, to recover. We, we carried that all throughout the, uh, uh, the Pavlo community. Uh, I, I still think the AFSOC and the rest of the US SOCOM forces feel that way today. You don't leave anybody behind. And, and, and when you're forced to do that, it becomes a, uh, uh, very, uh, it, it just weighs on a lot of people uh, when that happens. Uh, Chelsea, I, I, I think that's going to bring us to the conclusion uh, of our fifth edition of Soft Stories Live, Operation Desert Storm, uh, the rescue of Slate 4-6. Uh, for the panel on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation, we'd love to extend a heartfelt thank you for the service to our nation. And candidly sharing your firsthand experiences with our viewers. It's been an honor to see you distinguished gentlemen again, and I hope to see you soon. And thank you for participating in today's discussion. Please be sure to join us in February where our distinguished guest will be first the very first commander of MARSOC and actually assigned to the 20th SOS as a payload pilot, Major General Mark Droopy Clark, uh, US Marine Corps retired. Well, he will explore his recollections of the birth of MARSOC and their very uh, their actual formal integration to U.S. Special Operations Command. We look forward to having you join us again. Until then, on behalf of the Global Soft Foundation and Soft Stories Live, thank you. I am the host, Chief Master Sergeant Randy Anderson, U.S. Air Force retired and former Air Commando. Good afternoon and God bless America. Hey, this is Stu Braid with the Global Soft Foundation. If you like that video, go ahead and click on subscribe and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you're really interested in special operations and the Global Soft Foundation, go to our website at gsoft.org. Go over to join and join.